Both risk now being imprisoned by Rome. Because they identify with this criminal. They weren't family. The families were the ones that were supposed to come. And where were the families, by the way? Where were the disciples, by the way? And where were the women that were there watching from a distance? How come none of them came to take down the body of Jesus off that cross? Where was everybody? They weren't there. Where were they? But here come two men who have been hiding They've been hiding. And now they throw everything, everything away. They risk it all to do one last thing for their teacher. Verse 40. Then took they the body of Jesus. Now Jesus had to come down off the cross. Do you know what kind of job that would have been? The nails had to come out of the hands had to come out of the feet. Can you imagine trying to handle that body? The back would have been torn to shreds by the beating he received from the scourging. The crown of thorns on his head, you've got to be careful of that because if that hits you, you're going to bleed too. And the body would have been slippery from all of the blood and serum that was running all over it. And these two men are the only ones that we know of that are there and They're taking down the body. Two counselors, two Pharisees, two rulers of the Jews, secret disciples no longer, because not only now have they identified with Christ, they are covered with his blood, taking the body off the cross and laying it down on the ground. Now you'll notice that, is it verse 40? In verse 40, it says they wound... They wound it, that is the body, in the linen clothes and the spices as the manner, this is the part I want you to see, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now, the manner of the Jews, the body was washed on a normal occasion. You know, not not someone special, but a normal occasion, the body would have been washed, probably anointed with some aromatic oil, some spices, not this much, but there would have been some spice that would have been laid on the body, The body would have been wrapped in a shroud of some kind, not elaborate, maybe not even fine linen like this was, and then laid in the tomb. That's the manner of the Jews to bury. And that's what these men have to do now. They have the body of Jesus. They've taken him off the cross. Now they've got him on the dirty ground. They have to get him up, wash him with water, take the crown of thorns off his head, completely clean him, anoint him with oil. They probably had oil there and water. They had to have both of those there and probably rags to wipe him down. And then when they had him clean, they would lay out the linen. Now, we don't know exactly how big this piece of linen was, but if we look at the Shroud of Turin, which was a Shroud for a crucified man. The Shroud of Turin is about 14 feet long. It's all one piece, about three and a half feet wide. So they probably laid him on half of that piece of linen on a clean surface somewhere. Then they took that 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe, and they spread it all over his body. Now the myrrh and the aloe did an interesting thing. The, The chemical composition of both of those elements would have retarded the decomposition of the body, and would have made the body, given the body a sweet smell. So they spread that all over the body to preserve him. Then they would have folded that linen shroud over and folded it so that it was tight. Then they would have carried the body. Then still, there's just two of them. There's just two men here. And they carry the body and place it in the tomb. Do you know what? This would have been not only a messy job, and a long job, but it also meant that they were no longer ceremonially clean to celebrate Passover. They had just excluded themselves by touching a dead body and doing the rite of of, uh, internment. They had just excluded themselves from participating in Passover. But they don't care. At this point, what do they care? They're loving their Savior. They wound it in linen clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. And we know that Nicodemus brought the spices, but we also know that it was Joseph who brought the linens. 
In Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapter 23, we read that Joseph, when he had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth. That is Matthew's gospel. Mark's gospel says, and he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen, fine linen. And verse, or Luke's gospel says, he took it down and wrapped it in linen. So he's doing the work. He's the one bringing the linen. Nicodemus brings the spices. Verse 41 says, Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet lain. Matthew tells us about this tomb, that it was the property of Joseph. Matthew chapter 27 verse 60 says, And laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So this is Joseph's tomb. This isn't just any random tomb. And probably Joseph had had this tomb created for himself and for his family because these kind of tombs were meant to be used over several generations and probably had it made because he was living in Jerusalem. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. This is where his future is. His career is there. He's probably got a nice home there. You know, he may go back to Arimathea sometimes, but this is where his home is. This is where his career is. This is where he's going to die. And so he's had the tomb made. So what does he do? He puts Jesus in his own tomb. Mark chapter 15 tells us that there was a tomb or a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock. And then Luke tells us that it was a sepulcher hewn out of stone in which never a man was lain. So it was brand new. It was Joseph's tomb, the rich man who was the secret disciple, but not any longer. Verse 42. There they laid Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews... Preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. I would imagine as they're finishing the job, and who knows, probably you know, not even a dozen words passed between them as they prepared the body for burial. And all the time, Joseph, Joseph is thinking about that sepulcher that he had just had made. They had just finished cutting it out, which was a huge job and an enormous expense he would have gone to to have that thing created because it was in solid rock. And so the masonry guys would have had to cut through solid rock to create a room in that solid rock and a room with benches where you could lay bodies, a a room with a little niche where you could put a lamp or a place for presents or flowers and a stone to roll in front of that door that had been cut and a groove in front of it. It was a huge expense to create this. And no doubt Joseph is thinking the whole time while they're wrapping the body of Jesus and anointing it with all those spices. My tomb's just right over there. I think that's where I want to put him. I want to put him with me. I want him to be close to me in his death. And so when they finished, they wrapped him in the linen cloth Anointed him with all that spice. Which, by the way, if it was you or me, we would never have gotten that much spice on our bodies. Maybe a two-pound variety instead of a 75-pound variety. But this was something that was usually reserved for kings or prophets or great teachers. They said of Gamaliel when he died, they anointed him with 85 pounds of spice and wrapped him in linen. So they put him in the sepulcher there. And this was the next day that followed the preparation. Or this was the day of the preparation, which is before the Sabbath. So they put him in there, closed the door, and left. Two men who risked everything to serve the Savior. I dare say most of us, including me, have been a secret disciple at some time. I've decided that I would risk too much to reveal that I was a believer. I would risk ridicule. Or I would risk an opportunity. Or I would risk my position in a group. I don't know, maybe you've been there as well. You know, being a secret disciple is a vain and bitter thing. It usually leaves a bad taste in your mouth, doesn't it? These two had had enough. It was, a, it was over. The secret disciple thing was broken. And they did have a bitter taste in their mouth. And all their efforts up to that point had done little to nothing to keep Jesus from dying on a cross. 
And no doubt they came to that cross with broken hearts, saying to themselves, if only I had stood up to the council when I had the opportunity to. If only I had said more. Regret, no doubt, racked their hearts with grief. And so they threw it all aside. Threw all the things that they were afraid they might lose, they didn't care any longer. Now they come to the cross and they take down that bloody corpse and they do for it what they could at the very last. And Joseph gives even his own tomb to place the Savior. Of course, little did they know that in three days that door would roll away and he would come out of the tomb, crucified for our justification, raised for our sanctification. The Savior would walk out. But I think on this Easter Sunday morning, we need to examine ourselves very, very carefully and ask the question, Am I behaving like a secret disciple? And maybe ask ourselves the question, what is it going to take for me to cast all that care aside and just live for Jesus? Live for the one who died for me. What will it take? What will it take for you to redeem your relationships? What will it take for you to redeem your mouth? and your heart, and your eyes? What will it take for you to redeem your feet and your footsteps, your motives, your goals? Are you a secret disciple? Or are you his disciple, risking everything for Christ? Because that's really the difference. The secret disciple lives a life of bitterness and regret because You can't serve two masters. Jesus taught us that. Are you a Joseph, a rich man, who's going to risk it all? Or are you a Nicodemus, a teacher, who's about to be expunged from his religious organization? Who are you? I hope you're like these men at the cross who've given up everything to serve their master one last time. Oh, but wait. It's not one last time. There's hope because Sunday is going to come. And this devotion of theirs will be told from this point in the story until today. And they will have multiple opportunities to serve the risen Christ. What about you? Jesus will meet Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.